Gary Warner. Um, I think everybody knows, knows uh, Gary. Gary is the developer of Farm Outcomes uh, Clinical Health, is, is the company. <coughs> he also has two pharmacies in the Isle of Wight, which um, I saw his numbers in terms of private services, and uh, they're very good. And he's also in the PSNC, leading the working group that works on services, so I think uh, we can all agree that he is um, well able to, to talk on this subject. Uh, so just pass it over to you. Thanks, Connell. And uh, thanks as well to Adele and the team for making my day so much fun. Um, and for the previous speakers who've made my job so hard. Um, it's very difficult being uh, at this position because we all stand on the shoulders of each other and there are some mighty shoulders I've got to stand on today. Somebody once told me that at the beginning of a presentation, tell the audience something they don't know about you. So, you know, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a prescriber, I've got some pharmacies, I write farm outcomes, I manage farm outcomes, I'm on the SMC and the negotiating team. Um, and after a conversation last night, I decided the secret I would share is that I played a tuba. And that my proudest moment is playing in the Royal Albert Hall. That's the only high point. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you think back, pharmacists have always been clinical. They're with the people that people come to in our pharmacies and, and ask about their, met, their ailments. And the answers we've given have always been clinical ones. In terms of commissioners, though, in the past, clinical services were whatever you could scrape together with your commissioners, the local enhanced services. And then that split with the Health and Social Care Act, and now we have local authorities commissioning pharmacy services as well. The CCG standard services and um, the NHS England national services from the RLOs becomes more and more fragmented. And now, this is my pharmacy today. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different purchases of my services that are not individuals. These are not private services, these are commissioned services. Um, it is plenty going on. And then we can add to that the advanced services and the national pilots. Pharmacy is really busy with clinical services already. And I think that's one of the really positive things that I felt that when we launched CPCS last week, nobody was shocked, nobody was frightened, we were well used to delivering a clinical service to patients. Interestingly, although Rob's had the experience of people being upset and angry about the loss of MURs, I've not actually had anybody come to me and say, well, I'm sorry to see that go. And I think part of that is we are particularly poor at recruiting in pharmacy. We seem to be humble and hide our light under a, under a bushel. Um, but the new services that are coming out, or at least the first ones, are push services. They, people are being referred to us, and that's a really positive thing, because the one thing that we are really good at, whether somebody walks in through the door, picks up the phone, comes in on an app, is actually giving the patient care in front of us now. But it is definitely a complex environment, and it's not going to get any less complex over the next five years, I'm afraid. But we do at least know what our purchaser wants to purchase from us. The person with the cash who's able to tell us this is what we want you to do and they've been absolutely clear about it and these are the um, these are the papers that rob was talking about before but i'll pull out the three main ones which he's covered in uh, to a certain level urgent care so we can see that already cpcs minor illness cpcs urgent supply but the big one the really big one is yet to come so the first ones are coming through NHS 111. Uh, has anybody here been in a pharmacy and received one of these referrals? Only going seven days. Lovely, great. And where did it come from? It should have said this is from a certain call centre. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Super. So we know that 270 people out there in the last seven days have been referred by an app. NHS 111 online, up in the northwest, actually already does these referrals automatically. But the big one is local referrals. That is where pharmacy will really save the NHS's bacon because these are referrals from your local GP practice. It's being piloted now. One of the reasons I'm in London this week is um, to see some fresh air and blue sky, which is the first time in 11 weeks. 
And uh, when Connell invited me to come and speak up in Manchester and I couldn't make it, and uh, Anik very kindly stood in for me with my presentation, he said, well, we've got another one in. And I thought, fantastic. CPCS will be launched, I'll get to see some blue sky, and here I am in a basement. <laughs> CPCS, local referrals, 20 million is the estimation in the second year that that is actually live across the whole of the country. Being part of the moment, it's going to take 18 months to get everybody up. One of the reasons I'm here is to integrate um, the referral system into some of the GP systems and find out different ways of doing that. That's one of the bigger challenges. If you think it's difficult to integrate into PMRs, you want to try it with a GP system. Medicine safety and optimization. Um, that's work that's currently ongoing with PSNC and NHS England at the moment, but the first step will be transfer of care. Anybody here received referrals from their hospital when patients are discharged? Uh, it's a surprise. So over half the country already does it electronically. A few are left doing it with factors. We're aiming to get the whole of the country on board in the next year. Um, it's one of the most rewarding things you can do, is picking up the mistakes that happen and saving people's lives. We know that if we do this, we reduce the number of readmissions. We know we reduce the length of stay. It's been studied time and time again. Um, it's one of the most valuable things we can do. The NHS isn't going to recognise the value of that. Let's be honest, the value of that is over £70 million pounds a year just from the pilots that have happened already. They're not going to put their hand in their pockets and give us that money, but they will recognise the value of what we are doing in terms of rewarding us for it. And then social care and well-being, as Rob said earlier, prevention is the first thing that goes when money gets tight. Um, but we do know that screening will be the next service, and it will be in the next three months. So for those of you um, involved in uh, screening services already, get ready for the hepatitis C screening service. It will be a limited period, a couple of years, um, but that's exciting and it's an opportunity for LPCs actually to build into the organisation delivery networks because although that's only the screening, there is a lot more performance you can do and if you want to work with your PCNs, your LPCs, that will be where I would suggest you look. So let's talk about some hard things. <coughs> So, the NHS long-term plan decreases roles for community pharmacy in dispensing medicines. You will have less of a job to do. Things will become more efficient. Things will be taken out of your hands. You will want to move things away from your hands and the NHS is looking to automation to free up pharmacists' time. I think it's also fair to say that the NHS believed that that was going to happen sooner rather than later. And thankfully, they've revisited that and understood that actually there's a whole load of things that need to change, not least the economics of it, um, certainly in terms of hub and spoke between two different organisations. But if that's going to happen, and Mike there was talking about the number of items that he'd gained, should that be our focus these days? I think as I go through this and you see what the NHS is saying, you might want to recalibrate your thinking about what you're doing with your business, which just completely builds on what everybody else has said. So, if we don't focus our attention on the delivery of clinical services, especially those commissioned by the NHS, then dispensing income is going to fall. You can take the first bit away. Dispensing income is going to fall. It is one of the absolutes. It's a mathematical truth. We have secured a deal for five years. Inflation will work against that. Cost pressures will work against that. You are going to get less dispensing income. You have the opportunity to replace that with service income. But if enough of us ignore it, and I don't believe we are, so Rob very kindly challenged me to find out how many pharmacists have signed up, and it was 75% a week ago, it's 80% today. That's a really key figure, isn't it? 80-20. If we don't do this and do it right, then high street pharmacy, community pharmacy, is in a bit of a pickle. Because everything will be driven online, because that's where the NHS believe the highest efficiency comes. So let's look at what the NHS is saying to us. 
These are public board papers. I downloaded these from the internet um, when I diligently did my presentation a week and a half ago, and not on Saturday night and Monday morning. So, they are going to make better use of the skills and expertise of pharmacists in different settings, including clinical pharmacists as an integral part of the core GPT. Now we, apart from losing some pharmacists um, to that, and I've lost three and I've only got four, um, but losing some to the GPT, actually it's a real good opportunity to engage closer, and they are our bridge. Okay. Better utilize the network through introducing new services for the benefits of patients and the wider NHS. Remember, they wanted us closed two years ago. I s they still want to reduce the numbers. They think there's too much going on in terms of clustering. But at least now they're recognising rather than remove the network, let's use it better. And that's a real step forward. Unlock major efficiency savings through the transformation and reform of dispensing. Or reform of dispensing. Automation online and supervision. <clears throat> I'll let you read that, but I'm going to highlight a few things. This is from the same board paper. 90 day dispensing. Now, there are those of us in the room, both talking now and who have spoken previously, who have waxed lyrical at length about 90 day dispensing and 120 day dispensing where it's appropriate for the patient and the pharmacist should be in control of that. Whether the NHS board and people that inform the NHS board have picked up on that, or whether they're looking for anybody with long-term condition, let's give them three months supply in one go. If you are a pharmacy relying on seven-day prescriptions for a non-clinical need, that will be the end of you. You need to rethink about how dispensing fits in with you. Linking the changes to GP prescribing and medication review services. Medication review services spec is not out yet, even though it was announced back in April. Um, it isn't our spec, it's um, a PCN spec, um, one of the seven, but it is getting close, and I can tell you now, community pharmacy is involved in that process as a signposting mechanism, as somewhere that the, uh, the GP surgery should be pushing people towards. So, the five-year deal, is up in 54 very, very short months. That's a statement from me. It's not a statement from anybody else. But if I was paying 2.592 billion pounds and it wasn't all being used up, why would I pay you for it? So the, the transitional money is transitional money. And unlike other commentators, none of whom are in this room, You've got to recognise it's £50 million pounds this year, there's £200 million pounds worth of transitional money next year. That is not in your head to be thought of to be used to supplement your dispensing. You should take that out and reinvest it. Reinvest it in reorganising, reinvest it, I'm not saying reinvest in Andy services, but... Yes, do. <laughs> <laughs> but think about how you can be more efficient. Because at the end of those 54 months, your support for change will dry up from the NHS. Andy made the allusion, uh, the allusion before about your rear end needs to be on fire to change. Well, the smoke is pouring off the rear end of community pharmacy at the moment. I'm, I'm hearing of pharmacies close, groups closing on a weekly basis now with you know, three quarters of a million pounds worth of debt because they thought it was going to get better. Well, it will get better but it will be very different. I'm trying to be positive, because the future is much better if we're not just churning over commoditized items. The problem with a commodity, as steel companies will tell you, is somebody can always do it cheaper. I can do it a penny cheaper than you. I can do it a penny cheaper than you. And when you're doing a billion items, a penny an item makes a huge amount of difference. Primary care networks, is probably, or Keith said it in his slide through Rob, this is the big one. This is our big opportunity to engage locally. Now, I don't know about you lot, but is there anybody here that's not signed up to the PSNC Tell Me What I Do Today newsletter? We've all signed up, because without it, I'd have been sunk. 
I can let that tick over and I'll do what it tells me to do and that's great, I don't have to think about it, so that I can engage locally. Now I'm not in a position to engage locally because I don't practice apart from occasion on Saturday in my own pharmacies. It's my pharmacists that are there that need to be part of the PCN. There's no point in parachuting in your area manager. These are very local, three, four, five surgeries, six, seven, eight pharmacies. It needs to be really local. It's the opportunity to see community pharmacy actually demonstrating what we know that it can do, which isn't, it hasn't been exposed to, GP practice haven't been exposed to it because all they've had exposure to is CCG and PCT pharmacists for the last 20 years, 20 years. So this is probably the biggest challenge that I get um, from people who are trying to change the way they work. And I'm sure nobody in this room is here, but the slides there, so I'll talk to it anyway. All of this is small change compared to my FP34. It's just not worth doing. I'm better focusing on my dispensing. So I, there won't be anybody in this room that doesn't recognize that. That's my revenue. So I have pharmacy, there's 21,000 items, turns over 2.3 million. And these are my services in the little sofa. But my income, my income from those services, and I don't do many private services apart from flu jabs at the moment, is very different. In fact, if it wasn't for my services, I can tell you why, my pharmacy would have folded four months ago. As a member of PSNC, I had to inject my own personal cash into my own pharmacy to keep it afloat. Without those services, I would have been sunk. The pop. What worries me is that in six months or a year's time, a lot of pharmacies will be in that position if all they do is focus on dispensing. So how are we going to measure success? Because something measured is something done. I can tell you now the NHS is getting really, really good at measuring. I don't know if anybody subscribes to NHS Network. It's a weekly newsletter, the best one I've ever read came out last week, which said we have a medium-term plan of collecting more data, a medium to long-term plan of understanding what that data is telling us, and a very long-term plan of actually doing something about it, which I thought was pretty true. At the moment, shortages, Brexit, wage increases, pension contributions, the changes to the contract, QPS, it's all there, it's all hammering away. How do you make clinical focus? How do you make clinical services a focus for your pharmacists? Um, so I just want to take a, a brief interview. This was something that I did when I was doing some um, academic stuff a few years ago, looking at services done by community pharmacists, trying to understand why local services so frequently failed. And uh, the, very small writing, but the Hungarian-American psychologist with a name that I cannot pronounce, who we're going to call Mike, <laughs> uh, looked for a term that described the state of being happy, and he called it flow. And I noticed that somebody called their software VFlow. Um, and think about when your team members are in the flow, they put their head down, they're intensely focused, but it's something that they want to do, something they enjoy doing, making them happy, they're never under-challenged, they never get bore out. It's not over-challenging to get burnout, and has a clear objective, and that receives pretty much instant recognition of what you've done, a positive or negative feedback, and it has to be immediate. And does NMS tick all the boxes? The important thing about our future services is they also tick all those boxes. They are the things that we enjoy, typically, being pharmacists delivering. We enjoy talking to patients, even the shyest amongst us, and we like solving problems, and we like making people like us because we make them better. But we've got to release the pharmacists from that poor outlook. So the biggest challenge to success, and I think somebody in this room that asked the question, what do I do? I put them in the consultation room, they're doing all these services, and there's a thousand items that need to be checked and seen. And I'm sorry, my back was to you. And it's a really, really good question. Now, the government's answer, oh, my answer is to shift it off premises. And if you've got the space and the capital, you can do that in pharmacy. If it's all part of your own group, all part of your same organization, you can do that. 
And that increases capacity and life most to save some money, I said. First one I've met, which is really good. If you've got the capital but no space, then you might be able to move it to a single centre within your own organisation. And the government's idea is, well, actually, we'll allow it to happen between different legal entities, which, again, is perfectly fine. As long as the economics work for you, you're going to ask somebody else to do your work for you, they will need reward. That reward will come out of your pocket, um, and there's not a lot of will in that. So I'm going to ask a question to the room, and I'm hoping nobody puts their hand up, because I've been asking this question for a, a good year now. What is the legal requirement for every prescription to be reviewed by a pharmacist? Don't expect you to quote HMR or Health and Social Care Act. We all know it, don't we? Deep down know it. What's the legal requirement? There is a one. There is a one. Nor is a GPHC guidelines. Every prescription needs to be touched, licked, smelled, inspected, back looked over by a pharmacist. The pharmacist is responsible in the same way that a GP is responsible when the nurse in the consultation room, round the corner, the back, on the floor up, sticks a needle in a patient. They are still responsible. In the same way that our ACTs act for us, we're still responsible. But if you could put a process in place that allowed the pharmacist to become actively involved when the patient's condition changes, when the medication changes, when there is something that is different, actually you've just freed up, I'm afraid, a lot more than 16 hours of pharmacist time. And it stops them being bored out. Because I think those 12, that 12% 12 extra time that you found is actually 12% that removes the stress of being a pharmacist in today's busy community pharmacy and will allow them to focus much better on this. How much better would it be if I was to inspect a prescription and do a clinical check on it 30 times a day rather than 450. I'll do a much better job on those 30, but I know everybody else is safe because I've put those processes in place. Because it was moving forward with data, I thought I'd better talk about some numbers and what we can do with it. We're all business owners, we've all got KPIs, we've all set ourselves tasks and challenges. So we've already got some well-known KPIs, um, item numbers, nominations, AIV, ratio, expensive items, and there's, there's a plethora of different tools out there, some of them much, much better than others, because they pay for lunch. <laughs> but they are experts at it. You know? They're the only people that can really do this and dig into your PMR data and interpret and present it. Um, and hats off to them, because it's been a long and hard and good job. A item numbers and nominations actually has just reminded me of something. The bit I was just talking about. How many pharmacists does the largest, busiest pharmacy in this country who do over half a million items a month, but I'm not going to name, how many pharmacists do they employ? How many hours do they do? If you take the number of items and divide it by the number of pharmacists times something less than a full-time week, because not all of them are full-time, do you know how many seconds per item gets pharmacist attention. It's all guesswork. 3.2 seconds. I think they've cracked it. We need to understand what they do and crack it as well. Technical services are more difficult to find KPIs for. You can say, how many flu vaccinations have you done? Excellent. How many minor runners have you done? Excellent. But it's really difficult if you're a regional pharmacy owner because you've got different services everywhere. It's really difficult to use. And as we become a more recognized deliverer of clinical services, you'll start to see retainers as a cash uh, incentive um, or a per patient looked after or per patient seen mechanism. And they're really quite tricky to do, quite tricky to monitor. Um, so if you use farm outcomes, which, if you're not in London, you almost certainly do. If you are a regional owner, you already have a login to see what all your branches do. And if you don't, don't come and speak to me, but I'll give you the name of somebody who can sort that out for you. I'll give you a dashboard of all the accredited services. It will tell you how many MURs, how many NMS, how many flu, 
How many CPCS? I understand that. Actually, when I go back, um, your audits, etc. It will tell you where you are. It will tell you where you are in your group. It'll do the local dashboards. You can download those as a CSV and work your way through them. And it'll do you some pretty graphs about how contemporaneous your staff are entering data. So we all know that from April the 1st, you must have IT in your consultation room. Perfectly that you can turn on, and that is connected to N3 or the internet. Um, if you see things like, oh, they're entering it five days late, once they've got IT in their consultation room, the odds are it's inefficient. There's nothing worse than writing something down on a piece of paper and then entering it into a computer later. You are double entering, and people have been banging on to me years about double entry, so um, I don't believe that that's an efficient way of doing it. And then we take it up a level, and uh, there's a, a mechanism called Contract Manager that looks at your local contracts within Farm Outcomes and other systems, manages it, pours it into Sage or whatever system you use, even if it's a bespoke one, and benchmarks it against other providers in your locality. It doesn't tell you where you are, that would be inappropriate. But we do know the average activity throughout the whole of the service, and we can see where you are in terms of above average, below average, top quartile, or bottom quartile. So we share it with you. So, um, on the dot, the future has arrived, and it's exciting. It's clear, they've told us what they want, and it's very different because items are not the be all and end all of your future. Because the one thing that an item will be worth in the future is less, I'm afraid. Any questions? Thank you very much. I shall see you.